Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for logging in for uh, a new session of our Future of Entertainment series, which is a little different because tonight we're going to be talking about the future of live entertainment. Uh, this is a conversation with Robert Greenblatt, former chairman of Warner Media Entertainment, and former chairman of NBC Entertainment, and Kevin McCollum, Tony Award winning producer of In the Heights, Avenue Q, and Rent. Um, I do want to just highlight a couple things from their bios. Uh, Robert Greenblatt is one of TV's most prolific executives and producers uh, whose careers span broadcast television, cable, and streaming. He was most recently the chairman of Warner Media Entertainment and direct to consumer, overseeing HBO, TNT, TBS, True TV, and the launch of HBO Max. He was chairman of NBC Entertainment and Universal Television. Uh, from 2011 to 2018, bringing NBC back to number one after a decade in last place and acclaimed shows with acclaimed shows such as The Voice, uh, This Is Us, The Chicago Trilogy, The Blacklist, uh, The Good Place, and many others. He's also a Golden Globe winning producer for Six Feet Under and a Tony Award winning Broadway producer for A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder and Dear Evan Hansen. And Greenblatt also brought audacious live theatrical events to NBC with The Sound of Music Live which was watched by 19 million people, The Wiz Live, Hairspray Live, and the Emmy-winning Jesus Christ Superstar Live in Concert, starring John Legend. Kevin McCollum has received the Tony Award for Best Musical for In the Heights, Avenue Q, and Rent, which also won the Pulitzer Prize. He's currently represented off-Broadway uh, and on tour with the uh, Olivier Award-winning The Play That Goes Wrong. He produced Mike Birbiglia's The New One, Something Rotten, Hand to God, Motown the Musical, The Drowsy Chaperone in 2006, which won five Tony Awards, Baz Luhrmann's production of Puccini's La Boheme in, 20, uh, in 2002, um, as well as the touring production of Irving Berlin's White Christmas, the off-Broadway hit uh, De La Guarda, and the recent hit revival of West Side Story, uh, which is currently being adapted into a film by Steven Spielberg. Um, so thank you both so much. Uh, I hope I didn't cut out too much from your bios. There is a lot more that could be said, but uh, I, I feel like we'll focus tonight really on the, uh, the live uh, and theatrical experiences uh, that both of you have such incredible careers in. Um, so I'm just gonna really get things started with a, a couple of, of quick questions to generate a conversation between the two of you. And then we'll take um, questions from the students in the Q&A box. And if anyone wants to ask a question, just uh, type it up first. And when we open it up, we'll call on you. We'll invite you over to be a panelist. And if you'd like to, uh, you're welcome to turn on your video at that point so that we can see you. Uh, if you're not video ready, feel free to just use your microphone at that point. Uh, no judgments here. Uh, so thank you both so much for doing this. I know you're both start grads. Uh, yes, we are. Did you guys no one else thank us? Were you there at the same time? We, oh, Bob. <laughs> I think no, we're there dating ourselves. Uh, we're a few years apart. Uh, I, I think I was there before you, Kevin, right? I, I was there in the mid 80s, is how I'll put it. Well, that's when they took 16 year olds. Yes, <laughs> you were there. I was there 87, I want to say 87 to 89. I think I'm the class of 89. I'm almost sure. And I, and I'm 80, I think I'm 88, but I don't remember anymore. It's been so yes. long. Um, one thing, um, I'd like to hear Bob's resume again, because it's like the most impressive thing I've ever heard. No, no, uh, I, I'm always I'd so like so uncomfortable hearing. I, I hate hearing my credits read, and um, all, all I want is the Pulitzer, so I'd like <laughs> Kevin's bio, too. Um, it, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Alex, thank you for bringing us together. Uh, we see each other in New York and in Los Angeles. We've had many a meal, but uh, we're, we're looking forward to this debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I should also just quickly uh, mention that you know, everyone watching, please appreciate that this is a really privileged conversation um, between professionals coming to give their time to talk to you about um, what, where they see things are going, but these are really just private opinions they're, they're not um, professional, uh, uh, they're not seeing into the future in a way that needs to be uh, tweeted about or put on the permanent record. So um, just to, in the spirit of trying to sort of see how we're all gonna make our way out of this, please just make sure that this stays, you know, 
within us, our SCA community. Yeah, I think I think we're, we're we all want to fight on, but with respect. Yeah, and, and as I said to Alex, I usually say things I shouldn't say publicly in these kinds of situations. So, um, you know, please uh, keep all of this as confidential as as possible. And uh, and uh, I will just want to make one clarification. I am not producing the current West Side Story because there's a lot of West Side Story out there. I, I produced the revival of the 2010 West Side Story, directed by Arthur Lawrence. The current revival uh, on Broadway, or that was on Broadway, I am not the producer of. That's Scott Rudin and David Geffen and Barry Diller. Uh, but I am producing, uh, along with Steven Spielberg and Chris McCasco, the, uh, the West Side Story film uh, uh, that uh, Disney is distributing. Uh, that will be released, uh, we announced uh, next year, December of 21. I was so, I was so sad to hear it pushed a year, although I understand certainly why that's the case, but I'm so looking forward to this, this movie. I spent a little bit of time on the set with C Steven and you guys last yeah, summer, I remember. a year ago now, and I know the movie's done. I'm just waiting for audiences, but here we are in this strange, strange world that we now live in where everything is shut, not just, I know we're gonna talk about live here tonight, but um, you know, everything has really been stopped in its tracks, including, you know, most uh, feature films. Television is going forward. It's interesting how all these worlds have merged. You know, I was thinking, uh, you, we talked about being in the Stark program. You know, we both went into essentially a film program back then, it was almost heresy to say the word television. Television was the bastard, you know, relative that no one would speak of. Um, and in those years, television has now become really the business. And I would also argue the art form. And I would include all of the streaming, of course. Um, that of, is certainly available now in the COVID world we live in. But all of the production has been shut down for television as well since you know March. And now it's just starting to get back in, up into production, but it's gonna cause real delays, real cultural delays, I think, for all of our live entertainment and culture and all of our filmed entertainment. And it's really an interesting and unprecedented place for you know this country to be in. Yeah, I think, um... We have to remember, and I think it's hard, it, it, we often forget because, uh, especially in, in the political theater we're in today, but, um, you know, what built our, we're still a young country, and let's hope we, we age well. Uh, <laughs> we, we came to live in this country to tell a different story than we were living in Europe. And, uh, and obviously there's tremendous uh, history of, of behavior when the European colonists came over to America and the French and the British fought it out and all the destruction to the native people. But one of the things that it, our democracy that was forged out of that was obviously this three-legged stool. Uh, and I always think that uh, one of the things our culture does, film, television, but mostly theater, reminds us that we have to have this collaboration in capitalism and in storytelling and in the business of the arts. And in Britain, they do, they have a history of collaboration. So that's why it's called culture. Here, theater, live entertainment, which is actually, the musical theater is an intrinsic American art form. You can argue the film was developed by the French, the, you know, all kinds of things, but actually music theater, because it's an immigrant art form, is truly, along with jazz, an American creation. And it is also, Broadway is one of the longest streets now in the world. It used to be the longest street in America. It's now the longest street in the world. It's an export, and yet it is a friction economy that in, in this world of COVID, and as we're gonna talk about the future of how film and live theater is merging, our business was the, basically the first to close, and we're gonna be the last to open. So, what is happening is there's gonna be an acceleration of these art forms and people are gonna realize, well, theater, which is storytelling, and again, getting back to the politics, 
one of the issues is when we took arts out of the schools, the people who are now running our country were brought up primarily in a sports model. So this is why you're seeing so much defense in our, in our, in our legislative bodies because defense wins and no means you win the, you win the negotiation if someone's trying to come up with a better idea. So I'm really, really, uh, I, I really want to discuss and take questions really about sort of the parallels that um, by losing live arts in our schools, we are developing ways of negotiation. That capitalism is a win-lose, what the deal is. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, if we learn anything about musicals, it take books, music, and lyrics, and you can apply that to legislative, judicial, and executive. And they all have to collaborate to create a story in which everyone feels safe and willing to pay taxes and take a risk and be part of this great story where people can actually make choices and feel good about their lives, which is why the shape of musicals, and we can talk about that, why they're so different than plays and different than television and film, um, and, and why the DNA of a film should never be on stage in, in many, many cases. Uh, uh, and, and, and genre that works really great in, 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 in film or television, um, will often fail in theater. And, 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 and there's a lot of interesting nuance with that. But this crisis, uh, the, the COVID has accelerated a, a, uh, a way to distribute uh, content, which you used to have to show up for, which is still not theater, but it's a way to let people know we will be back. And, 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 and the dynamic of how streaming is working and how well, so this is television this is versus movies, I don't know, but uh, I'm anxious to, to talk this through with Bob and get his points of view on this. If I can just uh, give a sort of launch pad for that very particular point of theater in a streaming age. Um, I, I want to step back a little bit to talk just briefly about the Met live in HD broadcasts because we've been doing them here. We were doing them for 10 straight years, I feel like. And uh, an experience that was really uh, limited to just people who were able to, to see the Met live in New York was suddenly available globally. And I feel like they got incredible production value from the cinematography that they put into those productions. I mean, obviously the stage is lavish, the performances are amazing. But they also started to think about how to shoot it so that it's not what you would normally see of just like a static camera of the stage. And, uh, and then one after another, from whether it was the Met or then you started seeing productions coming out of London, um, these models started to take over theater screens that uh, would have been empty on a Saturday morning. Um, and it starts to build a new economic model for what is a very expensive art form, if we're talking about opera. Then we get to COVID and all of a sudden, one of the most significant things that was actually put out in American homes was the, was the recording of Hamilton. And uh, again, I, have, I had never seen Hamilton up until that point uh, because I couldn't get tickets to the Pantages and I don't live in New York. And my you question- You should have called Kevin. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I-, I Call Bob. Yeah, call anyone. We'll be in touch. Um, but I, I do want to ask if the, um, you know, if the, the future of theater, of live theater, COVID or not, has to take into account this new distribution model. I want to jump in because I, I have so many um, thoughts and passions about this. And Kevin and I have talked about this a lot over the last, not just in, within the COVID time frame, but, but for several years now. Um, I believe it's all coming together and it's all, you know, going to mash together in, in really good ways. Um, I love what the Met has done. I love what the National has done. I, I love filming productions. You know, we call them stage captures, which is sort of a reductive, you know, phrase because it's it sort of seems stagey. But, um, I, you know, I love being able to take films, really good films of stage work and put it in other places. And I, I know there's a real feeling among most traditional Broadway producers, of which I would not put Kevin in that category, who feel that you're gonna cannibalize the audience. You can't do that for a long running show. 
you know, the, the operas at the Met run for, you know, days, um, essentially, and then disappear. And I do understand, you know, the sustainability of a long running musical or even a play. The longer it runs, the better off it is economically. So I get that. Um, but I believe there are real opportunities to take the stage form and put it into theaters or now the easiest way to do it is to put it on a streaming platform, right? Um, and I think you just build the audience. Now, are there gonna be some people who will only see Hamilton on Disney Plus and then decide never to buy tickets? Of course. But I think in the grand scheme of things, it's additive and you're gonna build the brand of what the show is and you're gonna ultimately build the audience. I did those musicals at NBC, those live musicals. That was another form of what I'm talking about. Um, we built a production from scratch. We filmed it. 20 million people watched, you know, The Sound of Music. I love to do the back of the envelope math. If you filled the Gershwin Theater, you know, full, it would take you something like 32 years to, to you know, to fill that many seats. We got that show to that many people. And I guarantee you the national tour that went out the year following us, which was the new Jack O'Brien production, benefited from what we did in that production. I believe it's all a good cross-pollinization. I've been having conversations with Broadway producers about filming their shows, their stage characters, and putting them on HBO Max, for example. I know, um, you know, uh, uh, um, Amazon is doing the Constitution, right? They're, they filmed that, and, and like Hamilton on Disney Plus, um, at HBO, we did American Utopia, um, the David Byrne show, um, and that's comfortable because those shows are closed or basically those casts have left. But I think there's a whole new opportunity to put shows on television, I'll use that word, um, sometimes before they open on Broadway, sometimes a year into the run. You know, take your pick. I would do Beetlejuice. We were talking about that at HBO Max because the Warner Brothers company owns that property. Um, the show was about to close, so that made people comfortable. But I think now is the time to mesh all of these distribution platforms. And ultimately, I think the high tide raises all boats. And I'll, I'll let Kevin jump in because I know he has strong feelings about this too. Um, I, I agree with you, Bob. I think one of the things that I think maybe a lot of students don't know or people listening, and I, I didn't quite know because I was a, a theater actor who got into the Stark program, and and then I realized it's all about distribution. And my first business, and it still is a business, uh, was a book, booking office, now a booking group. And we distribute most of the musicals and plays you see that travel around uh, North America, including Hamilton and a lot of other hits. And as a result, one of the things that I've always been frustrated with is we have Byzantine rules when it, when we actually film in a theater. There's no, um, when I made the Rent Live Capture, which was one of the, the first of these where we filmed the final night of Rent, uh, and that was with Will Chase, and you know, it was a great, great, great company. Um, and that is a wonderful thing that, uh, and we filmed it after the movie came out. But the movie, which I have very strong opinions on that probably are not, uh, purposeful or productive to talk about right now here. Let's just say it wasn't a hit. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It was a flop and they, they tried to film it as a fable and I, all the intentions were great. And of course it was the original cast. So I loved seeing them on stage. I mean, on the film, having grown up with them. Um, and uh, it just didn't quite, it wasn't rent um, in terms of what we understood the secret weapon that no one could be a victim. And it was really about against all odds, finding your family. That's really what it had to be. And we lost, I think the film kind of lost that thrust. And, but what it did do the film is we ran three more years on Broadway because it came out in our 10th year. In fact, we had to sue actually to keep it being released early on when someone who had the rights tried to make it before we wanted it made. Because the dirty secret, which is, you know, not dirty, there's nothing wrong with it, is that if you are the IP holder of theater, because it is not a work for hire business, you have the exclusive license as a producer or as a director or as a choreographer or as an author. And basically the primary relationship in theater is that of a producer and an author. 
and the producer is the studio. I call Bob, I call a couple people, say, hey, you want to put in you know, a couple dollars? We'll put in a couple dollars, of course, more than a couple of dollars. But we call some people and we say, okay, we have this money, let's, let's get a barn and put on a show. But what happens is, and what's interesting right now in COVID, and I have a couple of shows, I have Mrs. Doubtfire, which was in its third preview, and another wonderful uh, grad from the, uh, the screenwriting program, uh, Carrie Kirkpatrick, who also wrote Something Rotten, a brilliant musical that's going to be done all over the world. Uh, and it was a big hit on Broadway. But he, uh, he and, uh, and John O'Farrell, who also had written Chicken Run together, and Carrie's directed and written a lot of, a lot of theater and lives in L.A., but, but loves Broadway. The point is, is that if we run every week, the money actually is a real gross. There's no studio overhead. There's no weird accounting. It actually comes to the people who make the show. Now, what does that mean? So let's say I have um, a show and it hasn't even opened on Broadway, but I was ready to open. And what Bob Greenblatt did with the musicals is he made people who were kind of Broadway, coming up on Broadway, he made them stars by putting them on television. And once they were stars like Christian Borel or other people, all of a sudden, you put Christian and Christian was in something rotten. All of a sudden, people feel they know that actor. And it's so rare. In the 60s, uh, uh, in the 60s uh, film people and television people would go do summer stock. And you'd go see, you know, people who you saw on television. Alan Sue or, you know, Paul Lynn do Bye Bye Birdie. And you saw him on television and Bewitched. And you would go to the theater. I think that's what's happening now. I, I, I think if we can, I think what's been proven is it's not a cannibalism. It, it's introducing somebody who you, they come free or for $5 or on your subscription into your living room. And now, since they're showing up, I want to show up. And going back to my original comment of what this country is built on, it's about building your community by storytelling in real time. How are we going to live a better life by living a better idea? And I think musicals primarily, and I also do plays, but live theater actually is the connective tissue. It's part of our brain when we were coming out of the caves to go down into the river to wash our clothes. And culture began by telling each other stories while we were doing our chores. And, and I truly think we are lacking that. But the distribution, going back to everything I learned at Stark, it's all about distribution. Distribution, hey, there's this place. This is what the Met is doing. This is a place you can go. And this isn't really it, but these are the people and look what they're doing. And I know there's a microphone and you see that and it's false, but it's just like, it's a magic trick. It's like when you see David Copperfield on television, you want to go see him live. So I think that's what's happening here. And I think uh, a lot of this streaming, Diana the musical is obviously doing this uh, three week period of filming and there's a lot of protocol and it's I'm sure very expensive and very cumbersome. Yeah. That's a show. We know who the Diana the Princess is. We don't know the musical. It was opening this season. It was it had just kind of started. And, um, you know, their producers worked out a deal with Ted at Netflix. And don't know what the deal is, but it's going to be distributed on Netflix. Stop well, like when it comes back to Broadway, people will, when we come back, they'll say, oh, I saw that in my home. I want to go see those people live. And that's super powerful. We've never had an opportunity to get a show into people's homes before they open on Broadway. And that's gonna be very exciting. And with the same cast, because my- That's my point, people. Yeah. Well, for instance, exactly. Now with Doubtfire, it's interesting because part of the magic of Doubtfire was already a film and Robin Williams, and we've done a wonderful job of uh, Rob McClure playing um, Daniel Hilliard. And what was done on, on, a, 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 on screen in an instant, you know, we have some sec we have some 11 second transformations and it's the kind of show. Well, I can't believe that till I see it. So that's something that really has to happen in the theater. But Rob's transformation of Mrs. Doubtfire, there might be an opportunity. We'll see. We're, we're, we're looking at everything. Same thing with six. We have, uh, I had two shows. Uh, in fact, we closed if, if your listeners or watchers don't know, um, on March 12th, uh, Cuomo uh, is when we shut the theaters down in New York, and that was our opening night. So there was um, about a two hundred thousand dollars of raw fish waiting to, for us at tap. 
So uh, for the opening night. So we closed, we were opening that night. So technically reviews were written, but we didn't open because the reviews come out. They're written a couple days before, but then they come out on opening night. So it, it's fascinating. So we will come back and, and reopen. You'll and do, our, you'll do yeah. anything to avoid a review, won't you? I, actually, I'll, I'll run into, I, I actually got called from some critics and said, I really wish you had read that review. I said, uh, well, you'll come back. You'll make it better. No, meaning that it was, they were already very, very good. I'm sure. And, uh, uh, but again, that's a, that's a show where you have six, like Rent and like when we did In the Heights, before the people who were involved in the show, who made the show and were in the show were stars. It took me three, it took, it took Adina Menzel three years for people to really understand mm -hmm. uh, uh, who, who had the talent of Adina Menzel before she, she'd made an album. And, and now she's a superstar. And, and, and the same thing is going to be true with people that you're going to discover in both Mrs. Doubtfire and Six. And in Six, these women, these queens, are just amazing. And I am excited for uh, North America and the world, since they were, you know, it's a medium that goes across all borders, um, to meet them. And, uh, and then when we're ready to come to Broadway, um, you know, hopefully they'll be with us for a long time and also on tour. And so it's a very exciting new way to show people our show. And with the cost of advertising, it could diminish the cost of advertising because billboards are, are completely outrageously expensive. And so is the New York Times. I mean, we'll see when we come back if everyone's willing to go for less. But it's hard to change business practices. There's a lot of commercial real estate in New York that feels they're not, cha they're not budging. And they aren't. And so uh, it's a question on how long this goes. I have my theories. Um, but I think this capture is a very important tool for the authors of their shows to get their shows out and producers to show the world what's coming. And then people say, you know what? I like that person. I, I want to go see that live. And, and, and that's exciting. And look, uh, the other last thing I'll say about it is I think there's no one way to do this. So every show has to look at what it is and what it's attempting to do and figure out, is there a, you know, uh, does it make sense to do a stage capture and put it out into the world before you open or a year into your run or right as you go on tour? I just, there's many ways to do it and every show will have its own, you know, path. But I just think it's interesting that there are now these if there's a confluence of these different distribution platforms coming together. It's not only the shows exist live on Broadway, and then we make television and movies that are completely separate. I think there's a really great um, way to commingle this stuff and bring theater to a lot of people who, you know, wouldn't otherwise see it live. And in a COVID situation, I mean, you know, we, I've had these conversations with many producers. This is almost, uh, you know, a necessity right now. But I think even if COVID had never existed or happened, we would still be having some of these conversations because these streaming platforms now reach everyone. Look, Hamilton wasn't meant to go on that platform. It was meant to be a huge worldwide theatrical release, right? And then suddenly the stars aligned and the platform is up and running and already in 50 to 60 million homes. And they figured, well, why not? What are we waiting for? What better way... To, to put it out into the world. So I think more of this will happen in the future as, as we you know, get smarter about how to do this. And, yeah. and, and, and Hamilton was offering something very special um, is, is it captured the original cast. Yeah. And I think you see more people capturing original casts and just putting it in the vault. Because one of the things that's broken about the theater business is we need a better codified system of what it costs a producer to film their own show for distribution at some point. And I think some of the ways it's being handled right now is it sort of like, you'll know it when you see it, meaning we're just gonna, they're working, we're gonna capture it. If we ever distribute it, depending on what the price tag is and how it's distributed, we'll make the commercial deal then. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the way I think, because Broadway has, 14 unions and 16 different contracts. If you've ever tried to do a Rubik's Cube for the first time, that's what it feels like 30 years into labor negotiations for me. It's, it's still, it's very hard to line everything up in a reasonable way. And I'm not anti-union, I'm just anti-inefficiency.
and we all work in a very small, close space. And you're getting so if if I can get the show advertised by capturing it, and and if you're on the show for as long as you want to be, it's not like Pepsi that can sit on a shelf. I'm actually using that to bring people to help pay to run another week. So it's a very different way because it's not a work for hire business like film and television is. It is truly an exclusive license. I don't own the copyright. Uh, I rent it basically, and I can keep it for as long as I can keep the show running and for a period of time after when I can run other companies and other companies, which is why Rent went from Broadway and then to off-Broadway, because I share in subsids with the author, and we can talk about that in a, in a theater class about the business of theater versus film and television, and I'm happy to, to because I, I had to figure that out after I left Stark, and it's a very powerful economic equation if you, if you get the right story and the right material. And working with film, we can learn from each other now. We can say, look, for film, we're going to do it this way. But right now, it is still apples and oranges. And basically, we should, we should make it its own, its own fruit, as it were. Can we, should, can we talk about um, the current situation? And Kevin, yeah. you know, you're close to the ground, and you have two shows literally on the runway and tours. Yeah. And, and what is your forecast for what's realistic about the ability to get shows back up and running with audiences that are large enough that they can, you know, it, it could be economically viable. Yeah, I, I'm thinking a lot, Bob, about behavior more than the theater and about safety. I'm a 58 year old man. Uh, I still feel, you know, but I, I'm all about gathering. The theater is built on exchanging droplets, okay? That's why we go to the theater. <laughs> we go to the theater to kind of laugh with each other and realize who's in the audience and, and they're enjoying it. At intermission, you're much more aware of who you're sharing this experience with than when you go to a film. Just observe yourself before and after a film and how you behave. And you're thinking about, okay, after a film, oh man, I, I should have just gotten the small Pepsi. I gotta go to the bathroom. Yeah, you're just going places. And, and we actually linger in the theater, even if it's a one act and you get there early and you, you know, and you, you, you let every, all, the, all the ushers be rude to you, and it's kind of fun, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's too small, and, and, and it, it doesn't, it's doesn't, not comfortable, but we're all doing it together. And the air conditioning so, is usually really good, though. That's the, so, the main point for me. Yeah, so one of the things that I am very aware of, and, and I said this when we broke down, when we uh, shut down in March, and in April, you know, I'm on eight committees it's, uh, and, and, and trying to figure this out. But until there's a vaccine, I, there's no such thing as social distancing in the theater. There just isn't. And I'm not even talking about the audience. Because uh, backstage, uh, you know, because you can't cross lines. And what that means is, you know, if you're moving a piece of furniture and there's a wire there, the electrician has to move the wire and the carpenter has to move the furniture, even if it's in the same footprint, while you're putting it on a pallet. So already we have a very crowded backstage. Uh, and for an example, the crew on uh, Avenue Q on Broadway was I think a total of 15. When we went off Broadway, exact same set, I had five. So, you know, it's, 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 just, it's just a very, it's crowded backstage. Then you have the unions deciding they're in charge of the protocol, which they should be, but we also have to line up with the state and the city and just like USC, from what I understand, uh, happened is USC was ready to take students, but then you couldn't get occupancy from the county of LA. So it's very hard to run a business uh, or understanding a schedule uh, when that happens. So I'm a great believer that we are also waiting for a change of storytelling in our country. And we've been in this bell jar of confusion and misinformation. And so I believe, I've been saying this since April, I think it's nine months after the inauguration, only because there has to be a vaccine, there has to be an organized way to distribute the vaccine, and more importantly, dealing with the audience, they have to feel safe about buying a ticket. I'm gonna talk about Mr. Doubtfire for a second. We had over $10 million advance, we had return it all. And one of the things about Mrs. Doubtfire, we told the theater we were coming, a year and a half before we even went into rehearsal. And so all of a sudden places like 
oh, you know, Mount Sinai or Prosker Law Firm saying, we want 300 tickets for our interns. We want 500 tickets for the fundraiser. So you get all these groups. A year, just the idea of that show coming, can't wait to see it. Love the film. Love those guys who wrote something rotten. Can't wait to see it. So they fill up. And then we go advertise. We do single tickets. Well, we need nine months to fill up the demand again because we're starting from zero. And guess what? We're not going to have groups. Now we're at an advantage because if it's a new show, my belief is with six and Mrs. Doubtfire, it hasn't been seen by the tri-state area. And I wouldn't be surprised at the beginning of Broadway, and I'm not even talking about touring, which is its own other thing. This is just my opinion as I'm doing the math and in my own behavior on what I'm comfortable with. I need that 55 year old female in one of the tri-states to pick up the phone and buy a ticket for herself, her partner, her sister, the two kids, and maybe her parents. But if she's the person who might put any of those people in jeopardy by arranging eight tickets, she's gonna wait. And I understand that. <clears throat> so we have to feel safe. This is what I don't understand about opening up economies. How do you open up an economy without feeling you can breathe the air and survive? And that is at least, and I am being generous. Now, a lot of my colleagues, and we can't officially talk about this because we have a governor, we have someone from, we have a mayor, and we're being, and the, the theater is we're trying to work together. But I'm just a human being deciding where to spend my time and how to spend my time. I'm thinking only of behavior. I'm all for, people are thirsty for the theater, we want to get out there. But really, I'm like, I can't be responsible for putting anyone in danger. And as a producer, I can't put actors in danger, no matter how good the protocols are. Because those are theoretical. Because when you think about it, the bottom line is we go to the theater to share drama. It's impossible not to, both in front of the stage and in back of the stage. Film production is going to come back sooner. I mean, the set for West Side Story was very closed. You can create bubbles because you basically... You're, you're in the trenches creating something. You don't need an audience, and everyone's there for a reason with a job, and everyone there is getting paid. We are in a business where people are paying large amounts of money to show up. They're not making a living by going to the theater. They are going to the theater to have a communal experience in a world that is not allowed to be communal, with information that doesn't give us any sense of safety of how to be communal. So. Would I love it to be May, April? Absolutely. I don't know how that's possible unless the vaccine is so good and the distribution is so swift with one shot, not two, and that 55-year-old mother and aunt and grandmother and daughter all feel they're not gonna get anyone sick by going to the theater. Yeah. Well, there's one person in the country who thinks the vaccine will be that quickly distributed, but I don't think uh, most people would agree. So, you, so most likely the spring announced openings are going to drift into summer and probably drift into into fall. I, I you know, Bob, I uh, I only can talk about my shows, and uh, you know, we have not publicly announced anything um, because. Um, we respect the science. It's yeah. just that simple. And, and, and I'm all for being, listen, 9-11 happened. It was a Tuesday. Uh, on Thursday, we were reopening. And, and people have compared this to 9-11. It's not 9-11 because also 9-11 happened in New York. So people got in their cars from Pennsylvania, from Ohio, from Chicago, and they came to support a city that was a very important city to America. Unfortunately, our political system today has created 50 separate countries that money is the destination, as opposed, and going back to my initial statement about what is America, it's a story where the human uh, storytelling of how to live a better life, a free life, a life where we can actually have jobs and feel safe, and be an immigrant society to tell the story, which is why the musical was built, because we took Viennese Operetta, British Music Hall, 
Irish storytelling, Cubo Africano uh, influences. And the thing that also made the musical the musical actually in 1929 in Showboat is we turned it and we asked ourselves who we were and we were self-deprecating as well. And the Yiddish theater was a very important secret sauce to sort of being a catalyst for rather than being presentational and being that vaudeville music hall and Tin Pan Alley and look at us and say, you know, Old Man River just keeps rolling along. And, and we talked about, you know, we talked about spousal abuse in, in Bill, in the song Bill. And, and, and it's just so amazing how the musical reflected the American psyche. And I think Lynn, you know, one of the reasons I did In the Heights and why I'm, you know, so grateful to be a part of, of Hamilton and, 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 and distribute all these shows is that it really reflects where we are. So our musicals say a lot about our country. And there's going to be so much wonderful storytelling coming out of this very tumultuous time. And I am hopeful, but we can't be too early or we are actually um, hurting ourselves. So I think it's, I've been working a lot with the government. Save Our Stages is a very important bill. We have a couple of other bills. The good news is we're finally, I think, showing the importance of Broadway being the longest street in America and how it's also now film and television is excited about us. So they always put us with film and television, but we were sort of like, uh, you know, just stay in, the, stay in the basement. And we'll let you, when we need you, we'll just come up and you'll do some songs. But now we are actually, we're, we're moving out of entertainment and becoming culture. And, and if we can use film and television to help distribute that information. Um, we're in pain right now, but we're gonna come out very strong. Sorry for my ramble. I wanna just quickly ask something and then I'll, I'll sort of fade away so that you guys can chat amongst yourselves and take audience questions. But th this goes back to sort of the, the film, uh, sorry, the television model of theater. Obviously t TV and its origins was hugely reliant on live theater. Um, now I am curious about the difference between live and live to tape. Because Bob, you did live productions produced for television um, versus something like Hamilton, which, you know, they're, they're I, I, was it all one night or multiple nights? Yeah, so they were, they were sort of <laughs> taking some, some, uh, some bits and pieces here and there to create their perfect version of the performance. Um, when I tried to delay the Met Opera's even by two or three hours, so that I'm not asking 18 year olds to come to Norris Theater at nine in the morning. Um, there's a revolt uh, uh, because people want the live experience, even though that performance will be identical three hours later because I recorded it. Uh, I'm curious if you guys can talk a little bit about the mystique of live and whether or not that has any particular, um, if there's anything about that that's gonna inform the transition of theatrical productions to being presented on streaming versus broadcast. I, I, I wouldn't get too tripped up in it. I, I think the live thing is a good, is really a good um, element. Uh, if you have the right show and the right circumstances and you can make it into a big event. Um, and we did that in a couple of, uh, with a couple of big shows. I, I gotta say, I just gotta, this man, reinvented the popularity of the musical in your living room. And um, uh, I know it's still very soon after Sound of Music, but that was a triumph. And talk about, I mean, the work rules must have been nuts for you. Um, but I just want to say that it, it's a very huge shift what, what Bob Greenblatt did in this, well, thank industry, you. in this industry, the film and the theater, because he's a theater lover. And obviously he's a film and television creator, but it was very, very powerful and important to our industry. Well, I, and it was really exciting to do that and to get, you know, I remember when we did Sound of Music and, and nobody knew if it would work, uh, uh, certainly to, this, to the scale that it did. And I remember the feeling that Thursday of all during the day, people emailing me saying, I'm so excited about tonight, I can't wait. People like, you know, Tina Fey, who had young kids at the time, and she's going to gather with the kids. And everybody was really, it was a shared experience, unlike anything we get anymore. Now, it's, it was only a few years ago, but it was really before the big thrust of the streaming explosion. Um, 
which is the definition of not live. And, and you know, so people were excited to do that. And, and I love it. And I think it's great if you can pull it off. It's terribly expensive. It's really hard to pull all the elements together. But I don't think it makes the difference one way or the other. If Hamilton, to me, on film was extraordinary. I mean, in some ways, a more bracing experience than it was sitting in the Richard Rogers Theater because you could get in close on those faces and see every word and every lyric. And because it was shot over a couple of days and edited brilliantly together, it felt completely immediate. But to me, it didn't have to be. So I think, again, like, you know, finding different paths for different shows to different distribution platforms, there's different shows that are going to lend themselves to it, you know, and certainly opera, you know, you have your fanatics who want to see it the minute it's happening. And that's exciting. But I don't think we should get tripped up in that. It's not that um, easy to pull off. And the streaming platforms, by definition, are never going to do well, There will probably be more live elements in streaming platforms down the road, but that'll never be the thing that people care about. By definition, you love a streaming platform because you can watch things at your own convenience when you want it. And, and so I think live is great, but you know, it doesn't have to be. I'm just going to say on streaming, one of the things that's important to me in this new age of streaming, I'm not looking for the big dollars from the streaming platform. I'm looking for flexibility mm -hmm. because there are times I'm going to want to turn it on and turn it off. Because for me, as long as I'm still producing the live event for the authors and for the investors and for my sake, it's a tool to say, this is happening over here, but you have to leave your house. And, you know, theater is built on inconvenience, which is what culture is also built on. It's about leaving your caves and washing your clothes at the river. Um, and we all have to do that metaphorically if we're going to feel alive. Look at what COVID has done and what we've learned. Oh, you know, I've had enough time at home. <laughs> I've had enough time to work on myself. Uh, I've loved the reflection and the recalibration, but now I want to go and try these new tools I've learned while I've been in COVID. And there's been a lot of good other than economic because I was talking to my, you know, my, my kids were home and they're college aged and, and it was probably more meals we had in a row uh, than when they were in, in, on different, they were in different schools living in New York City and we were on different schedules all the time because of the activities. So it, it, it's a time to take our newfound connection with those who we really care about with our families. Because going to the theater is family. It's why our biggest weekend is Thanksgiving. It truly is. It's everyone like, and maybe it's because after Thursday, you're tired or everyone would just want to go see something on Friday and get out of the house. And my films are also so popular. But I, I just share that the streaming platform for me, the only thread is, to just sell it and let them be in control of it because they make it convenient. That's not interesting to me. Uh, it is when Mike Dunn producing the show. Yeah. But I think you're going to see a lot more uh, windows of clearance and territory. Once, and I think more theater producers are going to co-own the capture, not just let somebody take it and own it. I think you'll find lots of flexibility as deals are made and as these go forward because there doesn't need to be, you know, a wholly owned deal for a streamer to take your, you know, your capture away from you. And um, I think there'll be all kinds of flexibility to make that happen. It's another, it's another way to, to get producers comfortable doing something, you know, that they feel could potentially harm their business. And yet, you know, if you run it for six months and then you open up Broadway and, and then run the show for a year and then it comes back to the platform you know, I think there's all kinds of ways that can be yeah. um, figured out. Um, and I, 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 think, I think shows are going to actually capitalize the capture. So, you know, just to, I'm just, just to we spent probably around $3 million uh, before we opened in advertising and promotion. Of course, we're still going to need a lot of it. But I'd say maybe half of it was um, sort of just frequency and animated films, not even really using actors because we weren't in rehearsal yet but just sort of the title and some voiceover and just a lot of frequency because it's a well-known title and the artwork and the logo. But I could see doing a lot less of that if I also knew I could, you know, have a capture uh, very early on in my run and, and, and get it out there as it gets closer to the Tony Awards because usually you spend another 2 million just on the Tony Awards. 
uh, which is the craziest circus in town. Um, and uh, well, no, last night was the craziest circus in town. But uh, and that's again no disrespect to the circus performers who I who are very respectable people often. Um, anyway, all that being said, I am uh, I, I'm I'm. I could see this really being put in advertising and, and, and helping pay for the capture with a streaming company. Okay, I wanna open things up to some of these students uh, that have been asking questions. And um, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm gonna invite you over as a panelist. So if you'd like to, please turn on your video. Uh, I'll start with uh, Benjamin Schiff, who is a current cinema and media studies student. And just so that we can uh, make this go smoothly, I'll bring in the next person pretty much uh, at the end of the question. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hello, Benjamin, but you win for the best background. Oh, I thank you. Um, and the best glasses, too. Yeah. I'm liking this Q&A already. Um, so I thank you guys for coming. And I came to USC from New York to learn about producing and film and all of that. But one of the things that I really miss is being in New York and being able to, you know, leave during my senior year in high school lunch break to go get rush tickets for a show and see as many shows as possible. It's really a New York experience to see shows. But in fact, I was supposed to be home for spring break and go to a Missed Out Fire preview. So I'm sad about that. It's a but, very good show. Yes. And I'm a Rob McClure fan. So hopefully I will get to Who see Who isn't? It. Yeah, true. Um, and then, but something that I've been thinking about, especially since the pandemic has started is the last year has shown that they uh, holding on to that Broadway real estate can be really tricky and really expensive for different companies. I mean, we see the Beetlejuice Music Man gate and things like Frozen closing on Broadway and that it's really hard to hold on to these. And at the same time, we see some shows switching to a more dynamic model where like David Byrne toured with American Utopia before it came to Broadway and six was, I think, in six places before Broadway, including cruise lines. Okay. And cruise lines and in Boston, all of that. Um, do you see more shows kind of focusing on different cities besides Broadway if people are ready to travel? Are these are shows going to become more dynamic in terms of how they premiere, maybe going to multiple cities before arriving on Broadway? Is that be all end all going to stay Broadway or now that people are getting theater in their homes, is theater going to really go to them in these different towns? Uh, I'm just going to talk about the theater. It, it, nothing has changed in the theater. There have always been shows going on tour before they came to Broadway and touring if they can't get a Broadway house. It's just that, you know, the COVID is going to, is going to bring a, a new dynamic and that is how to distribute and how to hold on. What's going to happen is the shows that are weak, or have been weak, or have been running a long time, and maybe we're going to close anyway. This has accelerated that, primarily because a theater owner gets to decide who gets to be in their theater. Now, I have two shows. We're going to be, let's say we're shut down for a year and a half. Okay, that's basically, if I paid, you know, a, a typical amount on a contract, uh, the theater has to be available, of course, so my argument is the theater's not available, because we're not allowed to go into the theater, so I don't have to pay you. But they have my costumes are sitting there. So I have electric bills, I'm paying for air conditioning, things like that. And I'm sure when we come back, we can't, the theater, because they're independent people, we can't collude with each other and say, let's go to the theater owners and do this. So every show has its own discrete relationship with its venue and everybody makes their own deals. And part of the better deal you get is based on your track record. Are you gonna have other shows for them? Do they believe you can pay your bills? And um, so all I can say is I think the subject we're talking about is going to be useful during COVID to keep people aware of the shows. But the idea of touring or, or, or going, uh, that hasn't shifted. I think it's going to be harder to tour, actually, because Durham to, to New Orleans to Dallas to Memphis, and then you have a week in Cincinnati after Memphis, and they say, wait. We just have to shut down. Well, the way the unions work, it's like, you can't just, you have to send everybody home. And when they go home, because all of a sudden now there's a layoff and they get sick, how do you, how do you, how do you keep everybody healthy? Because you basically travel around 70 people every week on a musical tour. And, and uh, 
rock concerts are a little different because the rock star is usually the employer of everybody. So they all have to live on the bus and there's not a lot of protocol. They just, it's work at will because you work for the rock star. There's not a union of rock star workers. They're all people who want to just work in rock and roll. So that's a little easier to tour. It's really hard to go out on a tour unless there's a national mandate of how to behave. And so um, I, th I don't think a lot's going to change. We're just going to hopefully dream. Yeah. Kevin, to your point about nothing's really going to go back to normal until there's a vaccine that is widely distributed and seen to be effective. So once that happens, then touring can sort of go back to normal, right? And, uh, you know, interesting, Benjamin, you sort of brought something to mind in your question. You know, I, I do think um, once things are back to normal, um, touring may actually be a, a better way for people to go to shows who are still going to be afraid to travel to New York City, which yep. I think even when things are back to normal, there's going to be some residual effect of just people being more cautious about making big travel, you know, shifts in their life. So if the show's coming to your town in three months, you know, you may forego that trip to New York. And in that way, touring might be more effective post-COVID. Well, in fact, many, like Mrs. Doubtfire, because it's already an established brand, I could see us touring, or the appetite for touring our show is going to be huge. Huge. And also sit-downs in London and a sit-down in Germany. We don't want a European tour. We'll, we'll just, we love the title. We love the show. We'll do our own production. Let mm -hmm. us have the right. So I could see that happening because the, the, the place that really might suffer, as to Bob's point, are shows that are long established, in New York City that are big hits, that basically the secret is 60% of their business is international tourists. Right, who aren't gonna come as and, much as they did before. So they're gonna need the landlord and, 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 and perhaps the unions, if the unions wanna negotiate a lower rate for the industry, which we're working to make happen, which is nobody's really hurting enough, it seems, which is bizarre to me, because uh, <laughs> I'm like, saying we got to fix this and they're like oh we're fine let's see maybe the government will bail us out um mm, uh i'm someone who's always had to figure it out on my own so i i i i am um, that's not that's not how i think so i am i am concerned for my friends who have long-running hit shows that the tri-state area has already seen at least once sometimes twice and everybody's bar mitzvah has already been there so i am worried about that um I'm not that worried about it with Doubtfire 6 because no one's seen it and, it, and they're going to want to see the new stuff. Thanks for your question. Thank yeah, thank you. you. Okay, I'm moving over Elise, who is a 2020 Dramatic Arts alum. Wow, you have my thing on file? Wow, I didn't know. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, hi. hi, I'm Elise. Hi. Wait, what was that, Alex? Yeah, no, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, um, my name is Elise Marie. I'm an actress and producer. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I've really enjoyed the seminar so far. My question uh, that I put in the chat was, what conversations and what steps have been taken in Broadway as far as representation on stage and, and behind the scenes as well? Really good question. It's, it's something we've been talking about and working on. Um, having produced Rant Avenue Q in the Heights, uh, Motown, I, I have always uh, done stories about trying to find your family against all odds and, and, and that if you want to talk about race, let's just talk about the human race. Um, and I, I'm very, very uh, clear, like Doubtfire, you know, 20% of our cast, two of our principals are, that are nothing like the movie, uh, very important to show the world it is today. Uh, and uh, Six, obviously, is a show that does that innately. Uh, very powerful, multicultural women. I was born and raised in Hawaii, so I grew up in a very, I'm very sensitive to that personally. Yet, as a leader of Broadway, uh, we have the, the, what it takes to actually be in the league is a lot of, you have to be able to raise money, produce shows, and pay about 5,000 a year in dues. And it has cut out a lot of uh, people of color who are who never thought that the theater was for them and we're introducing. So we've relaxed rules of membership. We're getting much more, um, much more uh, 
diversity into the leadership of the League of American Theaters and Producers. Uh, we've just expanded from 50 members to 62. We've added two more uh, 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 black young producers who, 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 who are really doing great work in producing, but have yet to produce a show on Broadway fully, so therefore they haven't gotten to the status yet. So mm -hmm. we're trying to escalate the status because it's important when you walk into the room um, you know, I'm an only child and, and I and lost my parents when I was young. So I'm always like, where do I belong? And it's nothing like any experience uh, my black colleagues and uh, Latinx colleagues have felt. But having worked on shows primarily about those, those, those stories, I think we need more writers writing their stories about their own, their own experiences in this country and the stories they want to tell. And then come and find producers like myself and other young producers who um, you know, if, you, if you're a black writer and you want to work with a black producer, do it and tell your story the way you want to tell it. I mean, I told that to Barry Gordy when he was writing Motown and people said he shouldn't write a story. I said, you were a man born in Detroit in 1928. You should write whatever story you want to say about your life and I will be here to help you. And, and so it's not enough yet. It, this has been a, you know, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, change doesn't happen in a lightning bolt, but boy, is it time to strike some, some lightning bolts and, and uh, the industry because the theater is actually an ally, which is why I think we're also, there's been so much, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you doing more? Well, it, it takes five years to make a show. And w we are in a business where we have to be in rooms to make change. It's very hard to make change just through Zoom and through demands. But once we can look each other in the eyes and say, come with me, follow me at this rehearsal. You wanna be a producer, let me help you. Um, it's hard to help somebody through Zoom. Yeah. And I'm very excited about when we can get back into rooms and, and change the world um, one experience at a time. And, and the knowledge and the, the microaggressions and the, uh, the unconscious bias that even me and where I thought, hey, look at my work. That's enough. It's not enough. I have to, I have to uh, do even more with, with the tools I have. And if I can provide runways and ramps to get into this industry, if someone's really interested who didn't grow up in a family that even knew the theater was for them, but they really have a passion because they saw Hamilton or they saw they, they, their older brother, you know, sat in line for rent or, you know, or their older uncle. And they told them stories about watching. Then, 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 then that's, that's a biased theater because it's a hand me down business as well as we make the donuts every day. <laughs> yes, it, it is true. It is true. Thank you. Thank you for the, your, your uh, response. But we're going to do more. It's, 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 it's interesting because the stories are everyone has to show up to make a difference. And, and that's what's great. The theater, we actually let everybody in. What's your story? Compel me with why I'm telling your story. Yeah. And then let's go make it. Everyone really is on notice that this is a, you know, th this is work that needs to be done in every strata of the business. And it's going to happen. Like Kevin said, it's going to take a little time to actually make its way to the stages. Um, but there's a lot going on, you know, in the development of these shows and the representation and, you know, who's being cast, who's the, who's a part of the creative team, you know, who works the backstage crew. I mean, all of that is being addressed very consciously right now. And um, I think progress will be made, you know, famous last words, but I, I think everyone's really, you know, has the intention to to make these changes and they're long overdue yeah and, and actually the league had eight programs for diversity but there wasn't enough um outward we were finding like i i hired some company managers uh, especially after in the heights who were defined as latinx who really wanted the theater and they're working on my shows now and uh you know hamilton has ushered in uh, a lot of uh a wonderful you know uh sensibilities as did uh, you know as did uh in the Heights and as did, you know, working on Motown, I learned a lot working with Barry Gordy, hearing the stories, what he went through. And, you know, I really felt I did the work, but yet I was still the producer, a Broadway producer, taking Barry's experience and trying to put it on Broadway for him. Um, but Broadway also, the crew members were family members from the 60s who passed down their jobs. And that's, that's how the Broadway backstage works. Right. And it's a, you know it's it's a fraternity of, of 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 men and women who who started you know in the 50s oftentimes now they're letting a lot more people in they were before before um, 
before the shutdown and, and, and the, the heinous crimes against African Americans in this country were uh, exposed uh, in policing and in just uh, our president who uh, put, regardless of your politics, there is obviously a man trying to stoke a fear and division and separate us when we truly, especially in the theater, we enter as strangers in the dark. We spend it's two hours together. Let's maybe maybe two and a half. Don't go three hours, please. Just a little longer. One uh, hour with no intermission. That's my. Don't, big tell, don't tell Hamilton. Don't tell Hamilton. It is. It is. Is we go in as strangers. We turn out the lights. We look at other people who showed up for us. And we have a communal experience. Yeah. I mean, that was what Motown did. The music. As soon as we started to move together, we started to have families together. The music got under our skin, so skin didn't matter. We started to look at each other. It wasn't enough, but it was a soundtrack for change. And this pandemic, coupled with our leadership in this country, has shown the cracks that we have to repair together. And it's going to take white people, black people, Latinx people, Muslims, Jews, Christians, anything, maybe not Nixium. Maybe LGBTQ, I'll put it but, but everybody. Everybody. Yeah, it, it's, so, it's so wonderful to, to have seen uh, Ham, Hamilton just be like a, a, a great example of, of stories being told regardless of, of color. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and it's, it's hopeful to know that, you know, we're moving towards some progress, even though why, it makes it why, I went, why I went to the theater is they let everybody in. Actually, they do. There is still too many obstacles for... Yeah, but, but, but you have to you, pay four hundred dollars. Yeah. You can open up a storefront and tell your story live, and you don't need a studio exec like Bob to give you permission to buy your pilot. Just go tell your story. Yeah. So. I will. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank right. you so much. I'm going to bring over Courtney Dusenberry next. Hello, gentlemen. Hi. Hello. Hi, Courtney. Hi, I'm a fellow Starkey from 2013, so. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, obviously, to both of you for being here and also to Alex, always, for organizing. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I have parents who are on committees for local arts organizations. Um, you know, I'm in Arizona right now at their house. Um, and uh, I... I, I'm, I've loved the like macro view that we've gotten. Um, and so I'd kind of like to ask a little, a little personal-ish question um, in that I'm wondering in this time of COVID and you're sitting at home and you're, if you're on eight committees, you obviously can't go, you can't do a lot of the work that you both, I'm sure do for probably more than 12 hours a day. Um, so have you found any enlightening moments or, or phrases maybe in your pandemic life that you want to take back into your professional careers when things really ramp up again? Uh, good question. Um, you know, I, my life didn't change one iota during COVID because we were launching HBO Max. And so everything was just completely all systems go. And then, um, you know, it, when I left the company in August, it changed dramatically. Um, and you know, for me, I'm looking more at producing again as opposed to being an executive. Um, and I'm getting very excited about working with um, writers and, and, and producers one-on-one, -on -one, which is not what you do in a corporate job. Um, and for me, that's, that's very exciting. The one enlightening thing for me was the fact that, you know, we got so hung up on working in office spaces and it is great to bring people together, but it was remarkable what could be accomplished you know, remotely. And, and, you know, not that that's the answer to everything, but um, I think freeing up of people having to be tethered to an office is a really good thing. It, I think it just gives you a different perspective and, you know, you look at things in, in totally different ways. So um, I'm looking forward to not going back to an office the way I did. And I think that's going to be true of millions of people because I think the workplace is forever changed, at least the corporate workplace. Um, and will be some combination of partial work in an office and a lot of free time. We used to think, you know, telecommuting is what we called it, working from home was just, you know, a, a, a way of having a day off or not really doing anything. 
the amount of work that gets done by people every single day um, at home is truly remarkable. So for me, that was a big um, realization. And I'm going to think about the phrase that I'm going to bring into my life. And so I'll come back to you on that. <laughs> Great. Um, I will say that when we are, when, when broad, Broadway was very frothy, you couldn't get a theater. It was, you know, the money was, 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 you know, yet we went from a, a 10, a 10, you know, million dollar musical was considered a, a big musical five, six years ago, now 15. There was a lot of, and a lot of it had to do with advertising and real estate costs because there's only 41 theaters. So as soon as we shut down and I, you know, again, having to go talk to two companies within an hour and then cancel an opening night party with the paparazzi to a half an hour away from arriving was um, surreal. But after I had a little gathering for the cast of six that was opening that night and I probably shouldn't have had a cocktail party, but I did since it was right next to the theater. And at that time when we closed down, there was only one known real case of COVID from someone who was in our line uh, for six. So, you know, maybe I had a false sense of healthiness and I have not had COVID nor, nor um, do I have the antibodies. And I've tested myself three times. But the phrase that I immediately said when I came home is I said, this is a time of recalibration and reflection. And this is before BLM, before, you know, all the George Floyd heinous, uh, crimes that we've seen on the streets before Trump even escalated division before Trump made states get their own ventilators and duke it out like a back alley fight. Um, so I keep using that phrase every day when I sit down. I'm like, what, what do I need to recalibrate today? Which is why I have not been in the hamster wheel of my fellow colleagues. And this is just for this room. Oh, look, we're going to get this open. And again, I, I still you know, have a lot to do with and understand how booking agencies work, which is part of my business. And the booking agent's like, okay, we got to talk to Tempe, then we're going to go to the Amundsen, then we're going to, we got faith. And I'm like, it's not going to happen. We can write it down and create work and be on the hamster wheel. But until people are safe, I don't care what the policy is. I'm not going to be responsible for putting someone in danger. And if that means I, I, I have to raise more money when we come back, but I'm, we're putting money at risk. It's like, we're in the business, I'm gonna say it again. So just recalibrate. So sometimes when you're in it, you know it doesn't make sense, but you do it anyway, because you're on the ride and we're opening and we got it, okay, we did it. And all of a sudden, oh, we, got, we gotta have that billboard. Well, I don't know, do we? Maybe we just need to make a deal and stream it and then open the show. You know, I mean, this is that sort of, you know, recalibration and reflection. So I think, I think that's the way, and also there's nothing more important now than a sense of humor and graciousness towards each other. Yeah, love that, love that. Thank you so much. That's, that's a great phrase, recalibration. I, I hit on it actually when you were saying it earlier that, oh, I wonder what he's- No, doing. I've trademarked it, so my lawyer will call you. Got it, okay, understood. <laughs> um, so, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Courtney. Uh, I'm going to call on Gavin Doyle next, but there was a question from Ryan uh, Livesey that uh, he's no longer in the webinar, but I wanted to read it out anyway, because I'm curious myself. Uh, was there or will there ever be a Dear Evan Hansen stage capture? You know, I think there should have been. I, I'm a happy producer of that show. Um, and before that original cast departed, we probably should have done it. However, the uh, one of the the key producers in the on the team is Ben Platt's father, Mark Platt, one of the great film producers, and he always knew that he was going to want to film the show as a movie. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, again, as I said earlier, things every show has its, has its own path. I think if a show has a really definitive movie in its in its future, you may not need the capture. Um, and Ben's going to play the role in this movie, which you probably have all heard about, which has this phenomenal cast coming together, and his performance will be captured. But there was something to the electricity of that show on the stage and that original cast and Michael Greif's great direction um, that I wish had been captured. And um, I think if it had been today, it, we would have probably done it and also had a movie as well. But I don't believe there'll ever be a capture of it unless, you know, 
down the road that makes sense. I don't know. All right, Kevin, all yours. Awesome. Um, about, oh, Gavin, I thought you said Kevin. I have nothing to say about Evan Hansen. Can't wait to see whatever you do with him. <laughs> Alex, thanks for putting this together. And both of you, thank you for being here. Uh, my quick question was about how Hamilton and the streaming deal, which I know, Bob, you referenced earlier, trying to get Kevin to do stuff along those lines more so, has changed stuff. Because I know that was a deal that happened well before uh, it was going to Disney Plus. Originally, it was going to be sent to the theaters. So do you see that now as a new potential revenue stream? And how do you think about streaming or licensing in a different, different way now that you've seen that success? You know, I think everybody wants to jump on Hamilton. And it's the it's the exception that will not prove the rule because it's one in a million. So uh, there's no way to say, oh, I'm going to grab the next, you know, Hamilton on my streaming service. Um, I think it will open doors for lots of shows to get that platform, which might not otherwise, you know, in the, in the past, um, you know, they were just smart to record that and they just wanted to archive that cast and, the plan was to put it away for 10 years. I mean, Jeffrey said, it's going to be in the vault for 10 years. And then after a few years, they said, you know what? Maybe it shouldn't be in the vault for 10 years. And they started taking it around to all the movie studios and they showed it to movie distri distribution companies. And, you know, everybody wanted to jump on it. And ironically, Disney bought it as a feature, which was smart of them. I think well before the Disney Plus platform was even really formed and then like i said it just all happened to go in that direction but i do think the fact that it became a big event um has made a lot of these streamers wake up uh, look they're all my friends who run these companies and they like the theater but they're not deeply enmeshed in the theater like we are um and i think if it helps to open their eyes to other potential theater opportunities that they could stream that's great and i think hamilton has done that to a certain yeah, I mean, again, um, we did a little bit with Lynn, too, for In the Heights, where you know, when we were even off-Broadway, we had camera at the same radical media who filmed. Yeah. We, John Kamen's friend, and, and so he already knew Lynn before Hamilton, because we did In the Heights, and we did that, uh, that PBS special, which, you know, just to show that we, we spent 800000 to make that, of which Jeffrey and I spent half, and, uh, and I think Radical spent half, and, you know, we haven't gotten paid back yet, but I think we just finally recouped that because we sold it to PBS. We, for us, we were just trying to say, hey, we made this show about this Hispanic family living in Washington Heights, and no one thought it should ever come to Broadway, but we got it to Broadway, and guess what? We won you know, Tony Awards. And, and yet, interestingly, when we toured, it was very hard to sell. And, um, and even though I think it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant show, and of course, that show will, will get revived now at, at some point, and, um, and we have a lot more footage of In the Heights, actually, and off-Broadway and things like that. So um, it, it was great that they captured it. I think the, uh, the being affiliated Lynn's relationship with Disney is very strong. And it, it was a great deal. It made sense. And it made sense for the world at a time. I mean, imagine the timing. So besides it just being a piece of, of, of genius work, you know, theater is best in the time when it can capture the public's imagination and the time in which it is performed. And and to have a show like that, uh, that, that came into being uh, right out of the Obama administration into the Trump administration to just comment on the world order is just, I mean, the, the layers are almost infinite in its, its uh, potency and its healing effect for the time we're in. Look, and I think the fact that it did so well for Disney has emboldened, like Kevin said, other producers to, to just say, we're going we're gonna to capture. I know for a fact, pre-COVID, um, Moulin Rouge is going to capture, and they're going to spend a fair amount of money doing it because they have one of those audience-pleasing kind of big event shows. And I know there's other producers who are now really just baking that into their thinking. It's a sales tool. It's marketing. But at the end of the day, there's liable to be one, a distribution platform who's going to pay you for it because of the insatiable volume of what these platforms now, you know, want to want to license. So I think it's a new revenue stream and a new business. And I say that with a with a lowercase b. But 
if you have the right show, it's, you know, it's a major home run. And I, and I think the money is going to be diminished, though, if you have producers like me saying, I'll do it, but I'm going to co-own it, and yeah, you're going to be able to turn it on right before but, I do a tour, right before thing, they come back. I don't know if it's if, if you if have it's, the sh- If you have the show I want, I'll make that deal with you. Because right. otherwise, okay. you're not going to do it. Terrific. Done. Um, but I think, I think um, again, back to Moulin Rouge, I mean, I say the theater's about droplets. Moulin Rouge is a show about what happens when with droplets who don't wear a mask. So, uh, you know, I mean, it is about, you know, consumption is a main plot point in a virus. So, uh, anyway, it's fascinating. And, uh, or uh, not a virus, but a, uh, uh, is it a virus or is it bacteria? Somebody needs to answer that for me, please. I'm, I'm, is it? Uh, Let's ask the president. He knows. Yeah. It's, I know it's all going away very quickly. That's all I know. Okay, I'm going to bring, bring over Ricky Orr, unless there's something you. that you're dying to say, Gavin. I was just going to say thank you, guys. Have a nice night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It was good to see you. Yeah, Alex, thanks so much. Is Alex still there? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just I'm trying to give enough space to all of you in the, uh, in the grid view. Okay. Uh, so let's see if we get Ricky on. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is Ricky. Um, I'm a senior here at USC and I double major in business and theater. So this is very exciting that you came to talk to us. Thank you so much. Well. Oh, thanks. They're all my mom's records from the 70s. Those are good ones. You must have an amazing mom. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. So my question was for Robert Greenblatt and it was just basically that asking about live musicals. And since you set a precedent precedent when you were still chairman of NBC as like the rebirth of the live musical genre, what do you see as the future for live musicals? And since we haven't seen one since Rent in 2019 or since like Hair Never came to fruition on NBC, do you think we'll see more? I don't know that we will. Um, I think they, they have to really have a uh, a, a benefactor at one of these, you know, networks to do them and get excited about them. Cause like I said, they're very expensive. Um, and I was the benefactor at NBC and it, the first one worked. So we were able to do several more. I was really happy to see Fox do a couple that they got excited about it. Disney's been doing them at, at NBC. You know, they did a couple of hybrids with, you know, um, uh, uh, not the Little Mermaids. That would know what. Which one did they do? Um, the um, was it Little Mermaid they did last fall? Uh, um, Disney. Yeah. Anyway. Um, no. So I think Disney might do them because they have that DNA in their company, that that theater DNA. But I don't know that you're going to see them coming out of Fox or NBC or or CBS again, unless some crazy person like me gets one of those jobs. Um, I had the, the, the bandwidth to do it and, and, and just got excited about it. And um, I don't know if there's gonna be any more in the near future, except at Disney. Um, okay, so I think just so that we can wrap up on time. Thank you so much. Yeah. By the way, I, I thank you for the answer. Uh, tuberculosis is of course a bacteria, so. I'm glad, I'm glad. Just in case you were wondering, I'm glad we solved that. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go out to Andrea Rodriguez for the last question. Hey guys, Hello. how are you? Um, so um, thank you so much for this. Um, so I am a um, interactive media graduate alumni from 2009. Um, so my work is in dance. Um, uh, video games, immersive, so immersive kind of technologies. Um, I received a grant from the San Francisco Arts Commission to make a um, theatrical production, and it's called uh, La Rumba No Para, a salsa love story about growing up in the Mission District in San Francisco. Um, my first run was going to be next year, um, and it was going to be in the theater, and now I'm thinking about actually um, doing this um, outdoors and on the streets, and sort of like combining this um, silent disco experience meets live performance and um, augmented reality. 
Um, so I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on, you know, the future of what this whole panel is about, on the future of um, theater, and uh, what your thoughts were on outdoor um, experiences, and, you know, what have you guys thought about augmented reality um, and incorporating some of that within your work? Um, I, I would just say, you know, I've been thinking actually if we, if for instance we captured six, you know, should it be outdoors uh, so that there can be people and people can be safe and we can get a, a sense and event, you know, just for that. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot of people, especially um, as we understand how technology is kind of delivering information, even though it's not live, the production values we're willing to accept over this machine um, have actually kind of come down. Uh, and, and it's like, we can accept it as if the story is good. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of plays that we've watched, you know, this format of zooming or, or being apart and together at the same time. Because again, I'm gonna say it again, these stories are gonna reflect and I should think your work will probably be affected by this time, the stories you wanna tell, the sense of isolation and the need to connect, but the danger of connecting and what is truth. And, and dance is one of those great art forms that can, that can obviously speak in metaphor and an image. So um, I think your distribution and use of tools is greater and people are willing to accept them as, as, as now um, they're sort of like they're, they're established tools. You know, this kind of format is gonna be very established for just like in, you see in, in Dear Evan Hansen, you see all the texting as part of the theatrical. I think Zoom is gonna be very much a part of how characters, like you don't have to necessarily have as many actors on stage, but there can be a whole play because all of a sudden Zoom is gonna be accepted as a way to bring uh, reality in the suspension of belief in theater. Like It's like someone being on stage because it's now a character, it has a point of view. We're gonna, that's not weird. We get it because we live through it. So we're gonna take these collective experiences we have in this time of uh, recalibration and reflection and it's going to be poured into our work and anything you can think of anything that you're feeling from this time is going to be I think powerful and, and make you unique because you're willing to tap into what other people are feeling but don't know how to articulate and that's what artists do they they bring out live theater especially uh, bring out to us what we didn't even realize how we felt until we saw it reflected in real time about who we are and that's what makes the theater, it's never going to go away. It's just going to keep getting expensive, but it's never going away. I agree 100% too. I think you're onto something. And it's partly because of the times we just lived through or are living through. Um, I, was, I want to do hair at NBC outdoors live. I want to do Jesus Christ Superstar outdoor. I love outdoor. And I think now it's deemed more safe than indoor. And I think even post-COVID, that will carry on and that'll carry forward. So I think outdoor is kind of the new cool place to be. Um, and I, I agree with what Kevin said, technology is now, you can almost do anything in dramatic terms because we've lived through this weird virtual life for a while. And you know more about augmented reality than I ever will. So I don't even know how to answer that question. But I think but you did get on Zoom, Bob. You got on. You got on Zoom. You were able yeah, to get on, on your own. Yeah, no one was out. helping you. Um, but I just think you know, go for it. And the more experimental, the better. And I think it's now. It's never been more a, a more receptive time for that than right now. So good luck. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, guys. That, that was like the boost that I needed to oh, like good. push forward. So. Go for it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, All right, thank all right. you so much for sharing all of this with us tonight. Um, obviously, a lot of us are very invested in being able to go and see something in a theater again. Um, I've, I've started to be a canary in the coal mine. I've been down to the, the AMCs for a couple of movies. And so yeah. I think Kajillionaire last weekend, Tenet a few weeks ago. Uh, but I would, I would love to see at least some reintroduction of the you know if the Mets starts doing something I'll do that too. I have a question. Yeah. I know you went. You did the activity. Yeah. I know it's what you do. You're in your world. How did it feel? And how did what was the energy like in the theater? And how did everyone else feel and 
did once the movie started, did you just forget where you, what was going on, or did we was it always on your mind? It was almost never on my mind, to be honest. Uh, the the experiences were very different because the the tenant screening, I mean that that was in one of the AMC's that has the recliners. So you sort of are on, you're in your own world sort of anyway. You don't ever feel tremendously like you're part of a big audience, even when it's packed. So you're in isolation. So yeah, it's, I, yeah, I, I personally, um, going to see a film like Tenet or a film like Jillionaire, you know, indie, quirky indie film, um, those don't have the same, I don't need the audience's response the way that I do for a comedy or a horror film. Mm -hmm. So if I were to go see, you know, um, a film like Candyman that was supposed to come out theatrically, I would rather see that when it's safe to have a large audience and you can feel that energy. So it's a little bit self-selecting. Um, the theater that I saw Kajillionaire in was, was very empty. Um, so it was never, I mean, I sat in the back uh, uh, anyway, but for Tenet, I think it had hit its 25 or 30 percent capacity, but it didn't feel particularly uh, full at all. Um, and you know, we wore masks the whole time, and it really didn't feel in any way unsafe. You were not aware you had a mask on watching a, a film. I have a very comfortable mask. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, I think you need to share your number with everybody here. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's very, it, it has, I have a few of these and they, they wrap around so that you can put them over your ears and it doesn't tug on your nose. Okay. Right aid. Um, but yeah, it's very breathable. So no, it didn't bother me at all. Now, would you rather have seen, if Tenet had been available day and day on HBO Max, would you have watched it at home? No. You'd rather have gone to a theater? Yes. Uh, I would rather see almost anything in a theater, but Tenet in particular, alongside uh, a variety of other fall releases I would choose the theater for. Um, but it depends on who the audience of the film is for. So I, I think it's a great idea and a great, um, a great benefit to families across the country that Disney put Mulan onto Disney Plus. Right. Good. But I don't think that Tenet needs to be released on um, iTunes or Amazon or something because it's not necessary. I mean, you know, the economics of allowing a family to stay home, not have to take kids outside, pay for parking concessions, multiple tickets, et cetera, uh, was really a, a, a huge gift um, that they could do it at home. A film like Tenet is probably gonna be more of a, a movie that you go on a date or go see by yourself or see with friends. And, uh, and so you're a little bit more in control of the environment, I think. Yeah. Um, if you're not involving, you know, a whole family at once. I don't know, I, I felt fine. And so I would be, I would love, I would love to see something like Hamilton, you know, for instance, just put on a screen that I can go watch because now that I've seen it once, I'm listening to it all the time and I would love to watch it again. I bet you a million dollars they're gonna release it theatrically at the minute they can because it'll just be another experience for people to have. And I think people will go again and see that on the big screen. I mean, Absolutely. Anaheim is, is, is what, 20 miles from LA? It's, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to put interesting, I mean, and they, and they are doing that. It's not just the one film that has to take up 20 screens. So, um, you know, anyone that, that's healthy, that doesn't have obligations to, elderly parents or, you know, put themselves at risk on a regular basis, I don't think it's that scary of, a, of, a, of, of an activity yet, for now, at least. All right, listen, before we wrap, can I say one thing uh, yeah. publicly? Because uh, you, you, in, in Kevin's introduction, you reminded me, Drowsy Chaperone, which was 2006, I can't believe it was that long ago, that was the first Broadway show that I invested in at Kevin's invitation. And I have him to thank for bringing me into the theater. And I just wanted to say that publicly. And by the way, we made our money back on Broadway in under five months. Yes. And it was a phenomenal experience. And I love that show. And thank you for inviting me into the theater. That was my inaugural experience. Bob, it was pure pleasure. And, and, and to share the, uh, the journey on that show, but also how you took your love of the theater and pollinated 
Hollywood in a way that no one had is, is, is such a wonderful thing to see. And I look forward to seeing what you do next. And, and hopefully we can be in a room together making something happen. Sooner than later, yes. Great. Well, thank you guys again so much. And uh, best wishes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. For thank listening. you, everybody. Fight on. See you again soon. Take care. Good night. Bye.